Good morning or afternoon or middle of the night, wherever you are listening, watching me talk right now. My dearest AP world history students, welcome to unit one talking about Islam. Okay, so we are ready to discuss fragmenting and expanding the world of Islam in unit one, AP world history. All right, so I have to share the screen. That's gonna make me into a tiny little box. Let's open up my whiteboard. Okay. The worlds of Islam fragmented and expanding. Hopefully you guys already know enough about Islam to know that in 632, Muhammad died. If you did not know that already, you should know that and now you do. You should know that it's important. In the year 632 CE, Muhammad died. Now, AP world history begins in the year 1200 CE. So you're probably not gonna be tested on that, but it's a pretty important thing to know in life. Even if you're not Muslim, I'm certainly not Muslim, but I, it's an important thing to know. In the year 632, Muhammad died. So this whole religion, this whole big, huge world religion started up all around this guy Muhammad's life. And about 600 years later, this religion had spread pretty far. Let me show you a map. Okay, so Muhammad, I, to, I was on an eraser, I gotta switch to a pen. Muhammad lived his life here in Saudi Arabia. He died in 632, not 622, 632. By the year 1200, his, the faith built around him had spread all across North Africa, come all the way across to Morocco and all the way up here to Spain. It had also come all the way across here to India. That's by 1200. 1200 is where our course begins. Then from 1200, between 1200 and 1450, which is unit one, which is what we're talking about right now, unit one, between 1200 and 1450, it spread to Central Asia, which is this whole area here. All of this is Central Asia and the Balkans. Please, you must learn regions of the world. It is very, very, very important. When I talk about the Balkans, when I say the Balkans, you must know what I mean. You can't just do what you may, what some of my students do in my other world history class. When I say the Balkans and they just go, mm, you are in an advanced placement world history class. You can't do that. If I say the Balkans, you have to look it up. 
or I am perfectly okay with you raising your hand and asking me. You can raise your hand and you can say, Mrs. Givens, I don't know where the Balkans are. I am not going to tease you, taunt you. If I, if I do tease you, I, I'm just trying to be funny. I'm just trying to be funny. I, it's, it's fine. You are a student. You don't know where the Balkans are. It's my job to teach you. These here are the Balkans. And these up here, uh, no, these here are the Baltics. The Baltics are up here and the Balkans are down here. You need to know the difference in the Baltics and the Balkans. Okay, I've spent enough time on that. We have to get back to Islam. Okay, by 1200, it had spread all through here. Then from 1200 to 1450, it had spread through Central Asia and the Balkans. So now I'm gonna draw a little line down here. Now, all of this is controlled by the Islamic empire. This is a freaking huge empire for one government to control. One government. But look at the size of other countries. Look at Ireland. This is one teeny tiny little country. They have one government. Denmark, one teeny tiny little country. They have one government. I mean, even Mongolia is pretty big, but they have one government. This is huge, gigantic. They had a bunch of trouble keeping control. And that's what we are going to talk about in this lecture. Okay, so we're talking about this entire area, Central Asia, the Balkans. This is the Balkans. I know it's hard to follow this mouse, it's so tiny. The Balkans, Central Asia, South Asia. I should have included India in this, sorry. India's in there. <coughs> okay. All right, I can make that go away now. Let's go back to my whiteboard. Okay, so because everything was so huge, this empire had become politically fragmented. Politically fragmented is just a fancy way of saying broken up. It means that it, it, politically, you know what politics means? It just means that different leaders of different areas had started trying to take control instead of everyone following the one, the one like supreme boss person, everybody was trying to take control of their own little small area. Instead of all, let's pretend our school it has become politically fragmented. And it would mean that each one of the teachers starts refusing to listen to the director. And we all start making our own rules for our own classrooms because we're sick and tired of listening to the director 
we think the school is too big and he doesn't know what we need best for our classroom. And we start making our own rules. That's what politically fragmented means. By the year 1200, the ruling power was incredibly weak, was really, really weak. By, uh, let's see, um, now I'm gonna go kind of backwards. I know I just said 1200, but I'm gonna go backwards to the ninth century. To the ninth century. So what years am I actually talking about? I'm not gonna tell you the answer. I want you to figure that out. If I'm talking about the ninth century, what years am I talking about? Am I talking about the 700s? Am I talking about the 800s? Am I talking about the 900s? Am I talking about the thousands? The ninth century, what years am I talking about? Tell me that answer later. Okay. In the ninth century, most local rulers had complete autonomous power. Autonomous power. Autonomous means self, autonomy. That means that local rulers had complete self-rule. They did not care what the teachers were in 100% control of their own classroom and the director of the school had no power over them whatsoever, none, complete autonomy. In a, a major turning point, was in the year 1000, ap approximately the year 1000, not exactly the year 1000, but approximately the year 1000, some Turkic speaking people, a Turkic speaking group from Central Asia arrived, arrived into this Islamic area. And first they were treated as slaves by the caliphate. Give me just a second to finish this story and then I will go back and tell you what a caliphate is. So at first they were treated as slaves by the caliphate, but then they themselves started taking over. That's an interesting story. Okay, so I think, <coughs> sorry, caliphate. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, I have a pretty bad cold right now. Caliphate is just the Islamic word for governing body. You'll hear this word a lot. And it's really, it'll be really, really good for you if you just learn what it means right now. Learn what this word means because then you won't be confused in the future. All caliphate means is like uh, government or uh, governing body or um not really ruler, because when you think ruler, you think like king or something. It means like the group of people that do the ruling. The, the governing body is the caliphate. So like the government as a whole is the caliphate. Uh, I don't know why I was going to put quotes around it. So the Islamic Caliphate 
Let me go back to that um, map. Oh, I closed the map. I can just open up a new one. Google Maps. Here we go. Okay, so uh, here's the the Islamic world was around in here. And here's Central Asia. So Turkic people came from here into the Islamic world and the governing body from here first treated them as slaves, but then they rose up slowly. It was a slow process. It, it wasn't like this rapid revolution. It was a slow process. They rose up and started taking control. So they rose up from a slave class to becoming the rulers themselves. And then by the eleventh and twelfth by the eleventh and twelfth centuries, there was the Seljuk. Turkic empire, an actual empire ruled by them. And they started using the word Sultan, which is the Muslim word for ruler. Because so many of them, these Turkic people, had actually converted to Islam. So I'm going to slow down a little bit so everyone gets it. These Turkic people, Turkic people who are from Central Asia, who are traditionally nomadic, had moved into Islamic territory. The Islamic people had treated them as, or had enslaved them. And over a very, very, very long period of time, these slave class people had risen up and taken on so much power that they themselves became the leaders. But through that process, they themselves adopted the religion of their captors. They converted and they became Muslims and they adapted to the Islamic way of life. And they still spoke the Turkic language, but adapted some of the uh, more important ways of speaking in the Islamic ways. And when they became leaders, when they became the leader, they used the word for ruler, they used the Muslim word for leader, which was Sultan. And more and more and more and more and more Turkic people converted to Islam. And that helped spread Islam 
because the Turkic people were in Central Asia and were traditionally nomadic people. And so as they were moving and spreading throughout Central Asia, they were spreading their religion. They were spreading it all across Central Asia. They were spreading Islam. Um, but um, this whole the whole time, the whole time while this was happening, the official. Do you remember? Um, uh, let me go back to the map. The um, on this particular map that I'm on right now, I can't I can't draw on it. So you just have to remember that that big circle that I had drawn that had the whole the whole Islamic territory. Well, that that whole time from 1200 to 1450, there was a caliphate that was trying to keep control of everything. And that caliphate was called the Abbasid. This whole time, the, uh, the um, oh, no, I'm so sorry, I'm lying to you. Don't listen to me. Don't listen to Mrs. Gibbons. She's lying. Don't listen to her. For a very long time, the Abbasid Caliphate was trying to keep control. They were trying really, really hard. For hundreds of years, they were trying to control. But in 1258 CE, the final blow, the strike that finally just destroyed their empire was when Mongols invaded. Mongols invaded and the Abbasid Caliphate was done. It was done. And this is an important date to remember. 1258 CE, Mongols invaded and the Abbasid Caliphate, it was done. Now, everything that I said, remember there were all these autonomous regions inside that huge map where people were just refusing to listen to the rulers and everything was fragmented and they had been losing control like forever. Everything was falling apart. Everything was fragmented. These Mongols invading was the final final straw. It was done. The Abbasid Caliphate was over now. Okay. Now, another extremely important, extremely important thing in world history was when Turks founded the Ottoman Empire in Anatolia in the 14th century. Where is Anatolia, Mrs. Gibbons? I've never even heard of that before. This is where you would go to Google Maps and you would look it up. But I'm going to do that for you. 
I know exactly where it is, but I'm gonna show you how to do it. You would go to Google Maps, look up Anatolia. Oh, that's funny. I got a Anatolia restaurant uh, here in Kazakhstan. Okay, Anatolia, Anatolia Peninsula. Um, Anatolia map. Uh, Google Maps. Here we are. There we go. The problem is it's not really called Anatolia anymore. Oh, okay. It's not really working because it's not called Anatolia anymore, but it's Turkey. That's the problem. So this, this area right here is where they settled. So let's back out. Right in here is where the Ottoman Empire was. And the Ottoman Empire lasted all, <coughs> all the way <coughs> from the 1300s to the 1900s. My grandmother was alive when the Ottoman Empire still existed. Through the 20th century. early. Okay. <coughs> now we talk about India for a little bit. <coughs> In 1800 CE, the Turks went crashing into India. They went destroying Hindu temples, pillaging rich, wealthy areas, stealing money, destroying everything in their path and taking over. They, um, uh, I am so sorry, that's not 1800. I, that was, uh, I just wasn't thinking. I'm looking at my notes and they're very, they're very messy. And I just wasn't, uh, I wasn't thinking when I wrote, it's a thousand. Um, by 200 years later, by 1206, they had established the Sultanate of Delhi. Sultanate, that means leader, Sultan is leader. So the Sultanate of Delhi. But here's the thing. They never really managed to take over the culture of India. They were the leaders. The, they were the Muslim leaders of India. But the majority of the people remained Hindu. And they just couldn't ever get the people on board with converting to Islam. The, the people just weren't really into it. 
They, the people stayed Hindu. And they, they were able to get people in, let me go, let me go to the map. They were able to get people. So first off, here where you see Pakistan didn't exist. All of this was India. This was all India. If I could draw a line here, all of this was India. Ugh. All of this was India. You could get, they got the people up here in the north. A lot of them converted to Islam. And a lot of the people over here in the east converted to Islam. But the majority of the people in the middle all stayed Hindu. They managed to get approximately 20 to 25% of the people to convert, but never really any more. And um, <clears throat> the people that they did get to convert were often low level caste members of society. And that's because uh, Islam doesn't believe in the caste system. So that's a big plus. If you're an untouchable in, in Hindu society, then it's advantageous of you to hop over to a religion that doesn't believe in untouchables. Also, um, Islam enforces a tax on anyone that is not Muslim. So if you are Muslim, you do not have to pay taxes or this one special tax. If you are Muslim, you don't have to pay the tax. If you are not Muslim, you have to pay the tax. So some people, uh, they're called uh, tax evaders. If you don't want to pay that tax, convert to Islam. So people would convert to Islam just to get away from paying that tax. People that were tired of being treated badly because they were of some lower, lower class because of their, their state and their religion, they converted to Islam. Those were the people, the majority of the people that did convert. Uh, in, let's go back to the map. Two, two major empires were formed. Once again, remember, Pakistan did not exist at this time. All of this was India. Where you see Pakistan, it was India. All of this was India. Uh, where you see Pakistan, it was, all of it was India, but it was the Delhi Sultanate. And then below that was led by a majority, um, majority Hindu, and it was the Vijayana, Vijayanagar Empire. I'm going to write that down for you. And they mostly, mostly got along with each other. They didn't, they didn't fight too much. So here, you've already got the, Sultan, the Sultanate of Delhi. They were in the north, and this was Islamic. But always remember, if you see the word Sultanate, that means they were Islamic. Just remember that. 
If you're looking at a multiple choice question and you see the word sultanate and your options are something about Jews, something about Christians, and something about Hindus, and something about Muslims. Ding, 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 ding. The answer is Muslims. Because sultanate means Islamic. Okay. In the South was the... Vijayanagar Empire. And it was Hindu led. And now we move on to Spain. Spain was the far west of the Islamic empire. Let's go back to the map. Here we are, remember Saudi Arabia is where Muhammad was from and Islam spread across Northern Africa. This is the path it took. People, travelers, uh, travelers took it, mostly vendors like, um, People that were selling stuff took it all across Northern Africa. They spread their religion this way up through Morocco and up to Spain. This is the farthest west it came. And we came to Spain. Okay. And the Muslims called Spain... Al Andalus. And it had originally been conquered by Arabs and Berbers. Hopefully, you all know what Berbers are. If you don't, Berbers are just a tribal people here in Northern Africa. Berbers are tribal people in Northern Africa. Okay, back here. And at this time, Spain was an amazing, thriving, incredible place to be. It was wealthy. For all of Europe, Spain had the best agriculture. Cordoba, the city of Cordoba, was the most developed city in all of Europe. It was one of the most amazing cities in the world at this time. Spain was incredible. People talked about it all around the world. People wanted to go to Spain from everywhere. Uh, Muslims, Christians, and Jews all got along fine in Spain at this time. Everybody lived happily together. They were friends. They, they lived next to each other in their houses. They were they hung out together. They intermarried. Everybody was happy. They, uh, they contributed together to the high culture. Now, when I say high culture, I kind of wonder what, what does that mean? And high culture can be a snobby term. It kind of 
is a snobby term. Not kind of. It, it is. It, it's a snobby term. But I don't really know what other term to use. And it's used right here in this book. So I, so I don't know. I mean... When we talk about high culture, we're talking about uh, the arts and literature. We're talking about the opera. We're talking about the ballet. We're talking about the finer things in life. That's what high culture is. We're talking about astronomy, we're talking about physics. The, the things that the people of very high intellect do and are interested in. And low culture would be fart jokes. I hope you're laughing right now. That's supposed to be, uh, that was supposed to be funny, but um, uh, fart jokes are a low culture and there's a difference. Uh, but right now, think of the people in your life that you know that are of high culture and the people that you know that are of low culture. Well, Spain, during this time that we are discussing, Spain was a place of high culture. And people of low culture had no place in Spain. Uh, this was a very, very high culture place. Okay. And uh, also, while I'm talking about it, my classroom is a place of high culture. If you come into my classroom, please leave your low culture outside in the hallway. Uh, there is a place for low culture, and I can appreciate it but it does not belong in my AP world history classroom. Low culture belongs outside the door. When you come in my room, we are a high culture classroom. Thank you. Okay, so. Um, Islam at this time was absolutely, Islam in Spain was a high culture faith. They were all about education and 75, perhaps 75%, this is, I, I made sure to say perhaps, because we don't know for sure, but perhaps a full 75% of the population of Spain at the time had completely converted to Islam because people respected it so much. And people were really, really focused on education and bettering themselves. But, uh, uh, and this was um, during the reign of Abd al-Rahman. This guy was really cool, really, really cool. He was open-minded. 
He was into welcoming everyone and wanting everyone to be part of society. He said, he declared freedom of worship. That's for everyone. Jews were free to be Jewish. Christians were free to be Christians. Uh, he declared freedom to rise in the bureaucracy. This means in the government, like even though he was the leader and he was Muslim, it meant that a Christian could work in the government and could rise up in the ranks and everything was fine. He was basically saying that Christians and Jews were equal in society to Muslims and everyone should get along just fine. But it didn't last very long. So that was, I'm sorry, that was from 912 to 961 CE. This was the wonderful, wonderful time for the, um, this was the wonderful, great time for Spain. The best of the best of best of times for Spain, for Islamic Spain. Now, let's talk about the not best of time. From 981 to 1002, now we've got Oh, Mansoor, and this guy, he didn't like, he persecuted Christians and Jews. He made Christians build their homes lower than Muslims, like on hillsides or whatever, Muslims' homes were physically higher than Christians. And Christians were not allowed to wear crosses. You know how Christians always like to wear crosses around their necks? They weren't allowed to do that, nor were they allowed to carry Bibles with them. Christians always, they like to carry Bibles and they like to wear, wear crosses around their neck. Let me tell you why. Because he was afraid it might offend Muslims. Just a Christian wearing a cross around their neck might offend a Muslim. So they weren't allowed to do it. Uh, not allowed wear, I'm just going to draw a cross, wear cross or carry Bible Well, I am lost in my notes. And they were their neighborhoods were, they were only allowed to live in certain places. Like if this is the whole city and Muslims could live anywhere they wanted, they were blocked off. Like this is the, uh, this is the Christian neighborhood. Oh. I, I drew an F, sorry, I, I was trying to draw a cross 
And for some reason I drew an F. Anyway, um, they, would, they would block it off and say, uh, this, like maybe this is a Christian neighborhood and this is a Christian neighborhood. Also, just uh, so you know, uh, I capitalized it. The, the word Bible is always capitalized because it's um, a proper noun. And so, now oh, we're almost finished. This lasted about 200 years. In the year 1200, the Christians of Europe, the Christians of Europe decided they wanted Spain back. I don't know how much you know about European history. You have probably heard about the Crusades. This part, it, the, the Crusades, this part is not in this book, uh, but the Crusades started happening around this time and the Christians decided they wanted Spain back and they started invading to try to kick the kick the Muslims out and lots of fighting happened. And then, so now there's lots and lots of fighting between the Christians and the Muslims. And you had all kinds of uh, fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting. And eventually um, in the final straw was in 14, 92, you might recognize this, uh, in 1492 is when in Spain, Ferdinand and Isabella, that was the king and queen of Spain, finally conquered the final, final holdout of, uh, I'm gonna sneeze. Nope, okay, there was one final Muslim holdout in Spain, which was Granada. They, they conquered that one final holdout and they told them that they were, they must, either convert to Christianity or immigrate, which is leave. I'm gonna teach you right now the difference in, is there one eye? Yeah, no, two eyes. Immigrate and immigrate. Immigrate with an I is to come in. Immigrate with an E is to go out. Immigrate with an I is to come in. Immigrate with an E is to go out. So in 1492, Ferdinand and Isabella, the king and queen of Spain, conquered the last Islamic holdout in Spain which was Granada, told the Muslims, forced them, they had to either convert to Christianity or emigrate. 1492, hopefully that rings a bell. That was the same year that Ferdinand and Isabella gave three ships to one Christopher Columbus to sail across the Atlantic Ocean, and he stumbled into some islands that he thought was India. And there's a whole mythology that he discovered America. So let me go back to the map. So why that whole thing happened, why 
Spain became, went from being this totally cool, open and wonderful, loving, peaceful Islamic paradise to Christians can't even wear a cross because it might hurt somebody's feelings was down here in Northern Africa, the Muslims here were becoming more and more and more radicalized, more puritanical, Islamic radicals. And it was these radical Islamic uh, Muslims that pushed their way north and they were invading Spain. And it was these guys that, uh, that were forcing their way on Spain. So they pushed out the more moderate Muslims and took over. I don't know if maybe that rings a bell for anyone that's been paying any attention to current events in the world of what's happening right now, because there are lots, and I'm sure some of you might know plenty of moderate Muslims that are really cool and fun to talk to. And then we look on the news and we see radical Islamic Muslims. The same thing has been going on forever. And you just had a lecture on it. The same thing happened in Spain. It, the same thing happened in Spain. That, that, that's what I just gave you a lecture on right now. Okay, that ends this lecture. I hope you enjoyed. Bye-bye.